our first speaker, Matt Griffin, founder and CEO of 311 Institute, talking about the future of collaboration. Matt, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Imani. Hello, everybody. I hope you're all well and welcome back. So thank you, Stelios. So my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the founder and CEO of the 311 Institute and the World Futures Forum. Uh, so typically you can find me having lots of different conversations and debates with a whole variety of multinational organizations all the way around the world about the future of something or other. So I look at two futures. I look at the next 20 years, which are really sort of near term and midterm. And then I look at deep futures, which are 20 to 50 years out. Now, the reason why I do that is most multinational organizations typically care about the next 20 years to different degrees, and most governments care about the next 20, but also the next 50 years, particularly as it relates to the future of communications, health, infrastructure, jobs, taxes, welfare, state, transportation, energy, you name it. So when we start having a look at the communications sector, I work all the way through the stack. So I work with uh, organizations like Arm and Qualcomm, basically where we talk about the next 15 years of technology, technology architectures and use cases. I work basically with some of the device manufacturers. So for example, Huawei and Samsung. And a lot of the work that we actually do with them basically actually looks 50 years out. So both Huawei and Samsung are incredibly worried about being disruptive. So Samsung, for example, has a chaos lab in South Korea, which has 3000 people trying to disrupt the business from within. Huawei spends over $14 billion a year and has 45,000 people focused purely on R&D. And we've seen some of the impact of that R&D with, for example, 5G rollouts. Um, and then in addition to that, I also work with carriers. So for example, organizations like T-Mobile, standards organizations and research and development organizations like Interdigital and so on and so forth. So during this presentation, I'm gonna take you through the future of communications. I'm gonna show you some trends. I'm gonna show you the technologies and I'm also going to show you some of those nefarious use cases that everybody keeps liking to chase. So with no further ado, this quote was said in 1491, realize everything is connected to everything else. Now, a lot of people tend to think that Leonardo da Vinci was talking about the natural world, everything in the natural world being connected to one another. However, da Vinci was kind of a futurist. So from my perspective, I think he was probably talking about 5G. We'll get onto that later. Um, so trends. Um, now, Annually, the communications industry turns over about $1.7 trillion, which actually makes it larger, for example, than the events industry. Uh, there are actually only about three and a half billion people on this planet who have either any internet connection or a decent internet connection. Um, the other three and a half billion people are going to be connected up to the internet, um, typically via a variety of different uh, technologies and platforms, in about the next 10 years. So, and again, we'll sort of talk about that. So the significance of this is if you are an organization that provides a on-demand digital service or digital-based product, in about the next five years, your global addressable market opportunity is going to double. So think about Netflix, Disney Plus, think about financial services, insurance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a huge opportunity for organizations that can actually see beyond this curve. Um, now, at the moment, uh, estimates typically vary, but we believe we have about 46 billion devices connected. Uh, most of those belong to children, obviously. Um, with those devices are consuming over 80 zettabytes of information. It's a crazy number every year, and that's obviously growing exponentially with all those children producing reams of cat photos and everything else. Um, and on average, now this sort of applies a little bit more to the more developed economies. Um, every household now has an average of 10 connected devices. Now those devices are obviously things like laptops and computers and smartphones and everything else, but increasingly they're things from the connected home stall. So connected thermostats, you know, connected cars, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, this number should actually triple over about the next five years. Um, from a technology and use case perspective, we're actually only operating in 2D at the minute, but we have the opportunity to go higher.
So when you think about the vast majority of today's communication technologies, you've got fiber, which is in the ground. You've got 4G and 5G, which is realistically terrestrial. You know, they can get up to the top of a skyscraper, maybe a little bit higher, but not much more. And then we've got uh, a variety of different satellites in orbit. You know, when we look between that space that is between the top of the skyscraper and those low Earth orbit satellites, there isn't really that much. We're going to have a conversation about that uh, now. Let's have a look at the backhauls. So fiber basically is still the working horse of the internet. Um, when we have a look at all of the transatlantic, trans-Pacific cables, they operate at multi-terabit speeds. Uh, most of you will actually have fiber optic broadband into your houses. Now, on the one hand, basically that fiber will be able to be disconnected as we move to 5G. So for example, if you have a 300 meg internet connection at the moment and you live in a city, 5G will start being able to offer you multi-gigabit speeds. Um, however, you know, while a lot of organizations typically count fiber out, in the labs, we now have fiber optic technology. So you can think of this as lasers and optic based technologies that have pushed fiber speeds. And this is traditional fiber speeds. You could push this to your home at 43 terabits a second. At that kind of capacity, that puts the internet connection to your house way over the internet capacity that we're shoving across, across various transatlantic uh, fiber internet connections like the Hibernian uh, pipeline and all these kinds of other things. So 43 terabit fiber connections to the home, we have that demonstrated in the labs today. Uh, we actually do, we spin the laser, that's how we do it, spin light. Um, now, 5G, you know, 5G is really just starting to roll out, you know, particularly in the US, Europe, South Korea, China. Um, we're starting to see installations coming through in India and other parts of Asia, as well as the Middle East, but it's still early days for this particular technology. So 5G allows us to transmit around one to two gigabits a second. The actual record for 5G is 2.5 gigabits per second in the Samsung labs. But it allows us to do this with millisecond latency, so a latency of one millisecond. So that means that from the time that you do something on your connected device to the time that it takes to get that information back or sent or whatever it happens to be, that's one millisecond. That, this is orders of magnitude faster and speedier than 4G. And it allows us to do some very interesting things. Now, 5G, we all know that 5G uh, was the subject of a massive trade war. Um, we saw, for example, President Trump in the US uh, banning a whole variety of different Chinese organizations because of security implications. So, for example, organizations like Huawei and ZTE, um, as well as companies like DJI and others. So now what we're seeing is we're seeing China develop 5G and 6G technologies in one way, the rest of the world developing them in another way. So we are now starting to see a splitting of the standards. We're also seeing standard splitting in artificial intelligence and a variety of other technology areas. Um, and when we start looking forward to 6G, this bifurcation of the standards or the watering down of standards, whatever you sort of want to say, could actually start causing an issue. Um, however, you know, when we look at 5G, you know, you'll sort of be familiar with a lot of these different adverts, you know, welcome to the downloading a Netflix video to your smartphone in the 49 seconds era. Fantastic. Uh, the next one, welcome to robot surgeries, basically where the robots are in one place, the surgeons are 300 miles away and their patients basically are next to the robot. So the welcome to the remote surgery era like this we had a young woman with an acute heart attack the total transfer time to get her to our hospital was three hours there's a feeling of helplessness from as a physician that you know what the treatment is to limit their chance of death but you can't get to them our hypothesis is that if we implement remote robotics in its full capacity we will change the lives for hundreds of thousands of patients in the U.S. and millions around the world. 
using technologies like 5G networks and robotic systems to provide cardiac care at a distance and, and be able to do telestenting it has the potential to change the landscape of medicine. 5G technology really opens up the possibility to do these over longer distances with minimal delays in signal and transmitting greater amounts of data. Being able to reach a patient hundreds of miles away to deliver the care they need when they need it is one of the most disruptive things happening in the medical industry. So, for example, you could have a surgeon in New York. You could literally have a patient in an ambulance, basically parked up in a lay-by, basically with a, robo -sur with a robotic surgeon. And that surgeon in New York would be able to operate on that person or any el anywhere else around the world. So it's decentralizing primary health care. But those are kind of the, the sensational use cases because you're not really going to download a movie for Net from Netflix unless you're getting on an aircraft and you're not doing that anytime soon. Now, in addition to that, basically 5G will let us stream everything from the cloud. So firstly, your devices end up being dumb because all you need is a screen, a 5G chip and then some memory. Um, because of that millisecond latency. Now, in addition to that, uh, because we can stream everything from the cloud, basically you no longer need to download apps to your phone. So you end up with an icon, but actually all the information for all of the applications are held back in the cloud and the applications, the codes, the executables are also in the cloud. So say goodbye to app downloads. Say also goodbye to smartphones. Uh, you can literally welcome in the dumb era. However, it's not really gonna be that great for Samsung if they say, by the way, your next 5G phone is a dumb brick. Um, so you'll still end up with smartphones. Now, in addition to that, we can start pushing 5G content to virtual reality headsets wherever they happen to be. So in the US, we're actually using them for therapeutic needs where, for example, just like your, your online yoga class, people are now coming together with chronic pain sy symptoms to actually take sort of, you know, to have therapeutic online classes, but it's actually in VR. These have been proven to reduce pain, chronic pain by about 30%. Um, in addition to that, because we can push artificial intelligence to the edge and we can modulate what people see and the way that images are displayed in those virtual reality headsets, you can literally help the legally blind to see. So these are some of the crazy examples of some of the use cases that are coming down the line. Uh, we, of course, basically uh, with 5G, we, of course, enable vehicle to X. So autonomous driving of everything. We also enable virtual reality experiences along the lines of Audi's hollow ride while you're in the car. Um, Tele X, just like we saw a surgeon in one place operating on someone in another place, we can do exactly the same with the construction industry. Doosan had people in Germany controlling drone equipment in South Korea via 5G and building office buildings in South Korea, four and a half thousand kilometers away. So Tele X, Telework, Teleoperations, Remote Operations, call them what you will, they go onto steroids with 5G. The immersive world basically becomes real with 5G. Uh, so you put on a pair of glasses and all of a sudden you see the spatial web, you see the spatial world around you. Um, in addition to that, as devices themselves start getting smaller, so as we start seeing the development of augmented reality glasses, smart augmented reality contact lenses from companies like Mojo, and also virtual reality glasses, not headsets from companies like Panasonic and Facebook, all of a sudden, if you want to go to work, you put on something that looks like sunglasses and you can see these kinds of new augmented reality operating systems. So who needs a laptop or a computer any longer? I see if you want to go and work from anywhere, just take a pair of smart glasses. Um, in addition to that, we can reinvent FaceTime. So we can do some intriguing things because as the device formats change, 
Today we have FaceTime where we just do a video call, a little bit like what we're doing today. That's it. However, with augmented reality, bearing in mind it is rendered and streamed directly from the cloud in real time, you can start doing things like this. If you and your son, for example, are wearing some augmented reality glasses, you can literally play baseball. And when it comes to trying to figure out the trajectory of the ball, the direction of the ball and everything else, basically that's just a mix of different sensors and artificial intelligence combined with machine vision. These are actually completely plausible now. So FaceTime all of a sudden becomes holographic communication. Um, in addition to that, you know, we have different technologies like Microsoft HoloLens, basically, which has kind of the same sort of concept. Um, the world becomes your playground because when we do start changing these device formats, bearing in mind the biggest problem that you have moving from the smartphone to these other device formats is actually the display. Because I can put everything in your smartphone just into a button or a brooch or a belt. Um, but I need, from a cultural perspective, to get you comfortable with using new and different display mediums. Because if I'm ever going to get you to wear augmented reality smart glasses, you've got to break your smartphone habit. Um, but once we do that, all of a sudden 5G allows you to turn the world into your playground. So this is kind of like Pokemon Go on steroids. You can talk like a native. Now, what I mean by this is we have universal translators like the ones from Google but you can communicate directly to the earbuds in real time with one millisecond latency, which means you can be talking English, the other person can be talking Chinese or what have you, and the translations are real time. We have GIS and spatial awareness thanks to drones. So for example, if you're an insurance organization, you could fly a drone over this building or these buildings. You could actually take a 3D GIS spatial map you could actually assess how much of the building is flooded right then and there using artificial intelligence, big data and analytics. You could instantly put together a claim for those people and say, we know your house has been flooded. This is what we think the damage is. This is what we think the cost of repairing it is. Here we go. Now, next type of communications technology, high altitude, high altitude platforms. So these are typically drones that operate in the upper stratosphere at about 60,000 feet and 10 kilometers. Now, these become especially important when we talk about 6G, because whereas 5G is typically 2D, 6G technologies, which will start coming through in about 2028 to 2032, uh, actually go up to 10 kilometers distance. And these are increasingly being used for disaster relief. So we have things like Google Loon, basically, which has sort of recently been canned, but we have uh, companies like Thales, I see that are actually starting to produce high altitude platforms. So this is where you end up with internet and connectivity being beamed from very high altitudes. You have satellite internet, so LEO, GEO, and very low earth orbit satellites. Um, disruption from above. In 2015, I was having conversations with the boards of companies like Vodafone and Deutsche Telekom and all these kinds of guys. And I said, you will be disrupted by a constellation of satellites that will beam internet from above. And they all went, no. And they told me I'm an idiot. They didn't really. But generally, yeah, when we start talking about the future and disruption, yeah, most people like to throw an insult in there. But um, fast forward to today and SpaceX with Starlink are now beaming satellite communications down to Earth at up to 200 megasecond, 20 millisecond latencies. That can be improved for $99 a month. And that's going to come down. We think that space systems will start going at about 2.5 gig a second. Um, and we also, thanks to Vodafone and Nokia, have 4G and 5G networks being put onto the moon. So crazy. And as for 6G, we're almost done now. A couple of minutes. Um, 6G is an order of magnitude better than 5G. Latency is 0.1 milliseconds, 1 to 2 terabit a second speeds. It goes up to 10 kilometers. It's 3D space. It's called Isagun. And it is an artificial intelligence based network. So it is what we call a cognitive network. So AI will essentially run the 6G system. Um, but in addition to that, you know, when we start looking at future use cases, this, what you're watching here, is from Samsung's labs. It's a holographic TV because if you want to start pushing holographic communications, that are life-sized, so you know, like a six-foot human, for example, um, you need 6G. So this is actually a turtle, and as you can see, it, this is a, a very 
thin holographic Samsung TV. Very basic, but actually at the same time, very advanced. Um, you can also stream your brain. So two to three years ago, a whole variety of different researchers around the world connected people's brains together and allowed them to not only talk, tele talk together telepathically, but also play games telepathically. Look that one up, it's called BrainNet. Uh, we actually ended up with three people in one experiment that were playing telepathic Tetris. Uh, meanwhile, we actually have ALS and locked in patients basically who are actually starting to control jets and fleets of F-35s with the US military. So when we talk about telepathy, we already have telepathy. We already actually have organic hive minds. I'm a futurist. I look further out than most people. That's a good conversation starting at a party. party. And if you don't believe me, this is the last slide. If you don't believe that we can stream people's brains, for example, either to one another or maybe to YouTube, how about a video? So what we have here is we're using skull caps. We're using artificial intelligence, which decodes brain waves, and it decodes what people are seeing on a screen and it can decode codes their brain waves and then it displays that on another TV or another display somewhere else. So hence you can stream this to YouTube. So what people are looking at, people are looking at geometric shapes on the left hand side. The AI is recompiling and decoding their brain waves and it's showing the images on the right hand side. Now you're right, this is grainy, definitely not uh, high definition. Three years ago you couldn't do this. Another three years, this will be high definition. And actually, the Russians have just come out with an equivalent system that lets you watch YouTube videos and they decode uh, what the people are watching. And you can see that as someone's watching a car driving around on a screen, the person's brain waves are literally being translated into exactly the same images on another screen. And as for me, that's it. I'm out of here. Thank you very much. It's been great communicating with you. And I hope you have a great, great rest of the day. Take care, guys. Goodbye. Thank you, Matt. That was really insightful.